What's going on, everybody? This is Brian Mazik, a.k.a. Unique Mazik. I am the hardest working man in sports and gaming, and welcome again to Heavy Presents. I am just saying with Brian Mazik, and I am joined again by Lorenzo Reina, Ryan Sanudo, and Paul Boy Green Esden Jr. How's everybody doing today? I just froze on the screen. That's really not how I look. Um, well, not most days. So, gentlemen, week 17 of the NFL, uh, quite eventful. Um, many uh, questions answered, but of course, we're going to present a few more questions today, and we're going to start with Paul Esten's favorite team. I'm going to talk about the New York Jets, and there is a large individual that mans the inside of their defensive line, and he is quite the load, but he is also on his way to. Uh, free agency and there is there is a, a question as to whether or not this man Foley uh, Farukasi will be able or wh whether the Jets will retain him moving forward so I gotta ask you guys um, first and foremost do you think Foley will be back or and if you don't think he'll be back who is the the best possible replacement for him maybe you look at somebody who is going to come on a you know a little bit um a smaller budget something mm -hmm. to that effect who are you looking at as the guy who can step in for foley and either can prevent the jets defense from losing uh from from you know losing a step here or maybe even be an upgrade over him he's he's one of the i think one of the better young defensive tackles moving into the prime of his career sort of a thing so what do the jets want to do uh, for me personally, my my mind and my eye is kind of set on uh, one of the top free agents or one of the highest paid free agents right now. But I, I'm expecting him to um, probably take a bit of a pay cut. And that's Brandon Williams from the Baltimore Ravens. He's due to be a free agent okay. this year. I think for the Jets defense, they need somebody in the middle of the defensive line that takes some pressure off of their inside linebackers, allow them to shoot the gaps. Uh, a little bit more to get some uh, penetration into the backfield to help stop the run. I, I, I don't think or I know that Brandon Williams is not quite, doesn't have quite as much of a ceiling in terms of potential in, in terms of pass rush as Foley does. But I do like him overall as a veteran presence to help solidify things. I believe he made $10.5 million this past season, but he has missed some games. He's also getting up there a little bit in age. I could imagine him potentially having to take a one year kind of prove it deal to prove he's maybe worth another two year deal in his next contract. And so I Brandon Williams is the guy I think would be a solid fit for the Jets. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm going to start with Lorenzo. So I made mention of this man last week when when it was a question that was kind of relatable to this topic. And. I'm definitely going to stick with this guy as a guy who I truly believe can come in at a reasonable value and a guy who is is very familiar with Robert Sala, and that's Maurice Hurst from the San Francisco 49ers. I just look at it more closely that Hurst seems like he's he's gotten lost in that 49ers defensive line rotation. And when you really think about it, D'Amico Ryans is rolling with four defensive ends on, on the defensive line, and Hurst is naturally a defensive tackle good at shooting the gaps but it's like well i mean eric armstead got moved over to the b gap he's naturally a defensive end the new guy charles almaniku he's naturally a defensive end but they plugged him uh, as a defensive tackle i think with Hurst being a free agent for the 2022 free agency market and the fact that he has that tie-in that 49ers tie-in with robert sala i think that he could be an effective quick explosive twitchy gap a gap shooter maybe a three technique type for sala's defense so I mean, Hurst seems like he could be he could come in maybe at a not so expensive value, but I mean, I'm sold on Hurst being a possible New York Jet. That's a, that's a very uh, interesting thing, and I do like how um, you're definitely thinking in regards to 
matching schemes up and and picking guys who would fit into that particular scheme that could be a problem maybe if you're looking at brandon williams that that you might say that that doesn't fit Salah's scheme uh we'll see but what do you say ryan yeah um i was looking at the you know draft class for defensive tackles i didn't really like anything for the jets you know in the higher rounds and you know it's you're probably gonna have to get a develop uh developmental uh, defensive lineman if you were to go that route but i'm going to go for a guy that's experienced that you know as a cardinals writer you know he was in the division in the nfc west and now he's with the chiefs and i'm going to go with jaron uh, reed uh defensive tackle um okay. yeah he had a he had a slow uh first half you know for the chiefs but he's picked it up i think pff has him around a 70 grade over the second half of the season i think he just had a sack on joe burrow yesterday and i think uh yeah he has two and a half sacks this year there was one year i think he had 10 sacks so i mean defensive tackles you really don't expect too much in terms of the sack department i mean yeah you got aaron donald's in the world blah 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 but you want a guy that's a run stopper like Fadu Kasi? I think Chiefs fans would say that Reed is one of those guys that can, you know, apply pressure up the middle. And I'm looking at his contract. I think he signed a one-year, $5 million contract. It's going to be around the same because the first half was a little sketchy for Reed, but the second half he's done a lot better. So I think it's going to be around the same. And you know what? He's got a plenty of experience. He's been in the playoffs before. Um, and Salah would like someone that has that experience that – that's been in the playoffs and uh you know i think salah's seen him in the division as well with the seahawks you know he was a defensive coordinator obviously with the uh, 49ers so reed is not really like a sexy pick but in terms of finding someone in the right budget in the right area because i think the jets should you know throw their money elsewhere in other positions and not just you know fork up you know 10 15 million on uh, you know defensive tackle so i would say Reed, I think it's a exceptional pick uh, if you look at this uh, defensive tackle uh, class. That's that's it. I don't. You know what? You said is is not a sexy pick. I, I actually don't. Ex it's very very rare that you can find a defensive tackle that will qualify as a sexy yeah. pick. It's just kind of it's just kind of one of those things. It's a necessary kind of a pickup, and I you know people who understand football know how you know big of a deal and how big of an impact that position makes mm -hmm. but um i don't think any of them are going to necessarily be sexy uh and i don't think that you necessarily have to break the bank mm -hmm. to find a difference maker there so it's going to be in uh interesting i think reed does make sense as well but i gotta ask you paul um what are you saying uh, to, to the initial question on Foley uh, Fatu Kasi, who again is in the last year of his rookie deal, you know, on paper, you'd love to bring him back. Uh, you know, he's a, a day three pick, and uh, sometimes day three picks don't even make the initial roster, let alone carve out a nice role uh, with a team uh, throughout the entire length of his contract. So on paper, you'd love to bring him back. Good leader. He's been a good uh, run stuffing, 300 plus pound defense attack on the middle. But the problem is, is he's going he's to want that payday, and rightfully so. Good for the kid. I never blame a player for going to get the bag, but uh, I just think it'll be too rich. The projected market value is uh, peaked around, you know, seven and a half, eight and a half million per year, and that's a lot of moolah to dish uh, to someone that is going to be contributing in that fashion. So there are two names that jump out to me. First, I'll go as sexy as you can for a defensive tackle. This is a guy that does whatever he can to stomp through the competition. He's a guy that's willing to do whatever it takes to win. That's Endomic and Sue, baby. You know what? He has stomped on people's heads. He has sacked people. He's thrown people around. He's done whatever it takes. And uh, he's, a, he's a guy I loved coming out of Nebraska way back in the day. Super talented guy. And he's a guy that I think Sal will like, not just because the run stuffing ability, but the pass rush. Uh, from the inside, and that can open up the door, obviously, for the outside guys. Carl Lawson coming back next year. You have John Franklin Myers who could bounce between inside and outside. He's a guy I love a lot. So, Sue, I get the attitude, and a lot of people have questioned that part of his game, but you can't question the talent on the field. And the other one, this would be more fun, is a potential reunion. This is a guy I love, former rookie of the year. Sheldon Richardson, man, he's going to be a free agent again. I thought about that. I'm yeah. a big, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Sheldon Richardson. I've met him a couple of times. Really cool guy. He's got a lot of different beliefs. Uh, he's a, he can be a little out there, but he's a super fun player. And uh, again, with the Robert Sala scheme, everyone's rotating anyway on the defensive line, so no one is asked too much of the other. 
even Quinton Williams, for example, played less than 60% of the snaps this year because that's a Sala ph- philosophy piece with his defensive line. He'd be a fun one, too. So Sewer Richardson uh, as a potential replacement makes sense to me. Hey, so, Paul, real quick. So we actually have one thing in common. I also got a chance to meet Sheldon Richardson years ago. He played at College of the Sequoias in Visalia. Yeah. That was wow. during the time that I was reporting to Central Valley. So, And he was he was a monster during the, his Juco days. So. I will also say he has the best autograph. I'm currently looking at it uh, of any <laughs> player in history. He does for the S in his name. He does a money sign and then yeah, I remember Sheldon that. Richardson. It's the coolest autograph I've ever seen from a player uh, in history. So uh, I love Sheldon. He's got a special place in my heart. Yeah, you know, um, one other thing you would think about is whether or not the Jets would value Foley so much to consider franchise tagging him. Mm. Uh, you know, and locking him up. And I don't know. I mean, because if you look at, you know, what that would pay him as a mm. defensive tackle, would that be something that they consider as something to throw around? I, I don't think so. I think that they would just as soon let him walk at that point, uh, even though they may have wanted to keep him, but they'll have a certain cutoff. There is another name that you want to consider too. Okay. Um, Chicago Bears, Akeem Hicks. Akeem Hicks Ooh, wow. is a very versatile defensive lineman who can play inside and outside. He would seemingly fit that scheme uh, for Robert Sala as well. So, and, you know, both both the guys that I named, you know, have some Pro Bowl history. So just I, I love that. I will say real quick to your point, Brian, on the franchise tag, the projected number right now is just under $17 million, So no I will assume not. Uh, on no the way. franchise tag, but an option obviously you have to consider with all free agents. Unfortunately for that one, that may t- prove too rich. But uh, I like the thinking there; that's creative. Definitely, definitely. All right, next one up, we're going to talk a little bit of Cleveland Browns, and we're going to talk about possible trade destinations for. I mean, what what happened, guys? What happened hey, to Baker Mayfield? What happened? Terrible. Like, Terrible. like. You know, at one point, I don't think any of us thought that we'd be talking about a trade of Baker Mayfield. Uh, but now I I don't know that that's a, you know, a silly concept at all. I mean, we're looking at a situation where he could legitimately be moved. And I think most people or many people wouldn't even be surprised. So I'm going to ask you, Paul, yeah. if you were thinking about a destination – in a trade for for one Baker Mayfield, what's the team that pops into your head that says, "Hey, maybe that's that's where he lands"? Yeah, there's a clear name to me, but I'll answer it off the top. That like part of the question, like what happened to him? I think when you look at his history, he has a propensity for turnovers, and obviously, you even saw that on uh, Monday Night Football. And he had, I think it was 35 interceptions in his first two years. But the thing you loved is the touchdowns. He basically has a two to one touchdown reception ratio throughout his career, but that just hasn't happened this year. He had the four interception blowout against the Packers. So like, all the turnovers were, were, again, it's not great. You'd prefer him to not have them, but he always had the touchdowns. He said, well, you know, you get kind of the gunslinger mentality from Baker Mayfield, but recently you haven't gotten it this season, and that's where you get into the real issues. If he's having those turnovers and not the touchdown production, then it doesn't make sense. You know, uh, Baker Mayfield had a nickname here in New York when the Jets thought they were going to get him because at the time it looked like Sam Donald was going to be the number one pick. It looked like Saquon Barkley would go to the Giants, and the Jets were sitting there at three after trading up from six, and Baker Mayfield was the wish of Jet fans. Now, uh, unfortunately, we're good. We have Zach Wilson, but there's another team in New York that hmm. could use the same nickname. Give me Broadway Baker Mayfield to the New York football Giants. And I think, quite frankly, it's a great fit because here's the thing. You bring in Baker, They, according to the Adam Schefter report, they're bringing back Daniel Jones anyway. At a minimum, you have a guy that competes with him. The Browns and any potential deal are going to have to eat some of his salary. They already exercised his fifth-year option. So to make a deal similar to what the Panthers will probably have to do with Sam Darnold is eat a majority of his contract to move him and then get a minimal return. Now, the good thing, obviously, and the difference between the Darnold and Baker Mayfield is Baker Mayfield has shown way more than Darnold ever has, so maybe you get a better return on investment there. But that would be a great fit for me for the Giants. You get new scenery for Baker. He gets an opportunity to prove himself in the biggest media market in the world, which 
you know, may not work with him with some of the, the tiffs he's had in the media. But I think it's a phenomenal fit. I think it's great. I think he can rally the troops. He did it initially with Cleveland, a team that has been, you know, mired in mediocrity for so long. And the Giants, quite frankly, have for a long time outside of the Super Bowl runs. I think he can rally the fan base. I think he's exactly the kind of quarterback the New York Giants need and could take them back to the playoffs because Daniel Jones ain't it, baby. So give me Baker Mayfield to the G-man. I love the fit. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, I I would agree with uh, Paul if he picked another NFC East team, and I'm going to go with the Washington football team Um, because the Giants – I mean, I think they're one going to uh, bring back Jones, and I just don't see Mayfield fitting in New York. I mean, he's a head case already in Cleveland. Um, I don't see the Maras really doing that, and I think what they always do is they like to, you know, get, you know, a terrible backup quarterback, and that's what they did this year, getting Mike Glennon and whatever. Uh, but I, I think Washington football team makes some sense um, because Tyler Han- Taylor Heineke, I don't think is the answer. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people were just amazed by him, and I feel like it was sort of like a honey honeymoon type of situation where you you know you like the you know you like the girl in your honeymoon, and then after the honeymoon, you're you're done with the girl. Uh, so I, I oh, think wow, what kind I, of honeymoon really have you been on? What kind of relationships have you yeah. been? Yeah, oh there's a decent. Yeah, divorce sounds like friction, happened, my guys. You like, like the girl happens. on the honeymoon, <laughs> and then after the honeymoon, you're done with the honeymoon. Yeah, after happens after marriage. Yeah, yeah I, right, know. I know that. my feet. Beyonce's in the other room for Pete's sake. We're, we're yeah. set to get married. Um, the four divorces <laughs> are very common, if you guys didn't know. Um, so they're very oh, common. It's, well, we, we have, like, it's, a it's funny. Now. It's funny that the guy who's probably 21 is telling the guy who's been married for 21 years. <laughs> that divorce is hey, good, for you. good for you, Brian. But you look at, you look at the that statistics, but we could go all day with that. that but, uh, I'll just Simulac. tell you, with Washington, I mean, <laughs> what? That reeked of Similac. Yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, Ryan Fitzpatrick, that was a failure from the get-go. I never understood that. You need quarterback competition. They didn't trade up for a quarterback. Mac Jones was in grasp and they didn't do that um so i I think they need to get a veteran quarterback and i know baker mayfield has his warts and i've seen him this year he's looked terrible at times like if people want to give him you know the injury concern to say oh he has a shoulder injury that's why he's playing bad well i'm seeing him and it's also the lack of decision making is a lack of reading coverages it's a lack of accuracy it's just the whole nine yards with baker um, and you haven't seen any of his traits from last year. So it's definitely uh, tough to see if you're a Browns fan. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with Stefanski, too. I feel like Stefanski has to start like running the football like a little bit more. I, I really don't get that. I think a Browns player last week told the Browns to run the football, and they weren't. I don't even think they did it that much either against the Steelers. But nonetheless, I think Washington makes sense. Um, they need a quarterback. They haven't had a quarterback in God knows how long. I think practically ever, you know, ever since I've been on this earth of my 24 years, they've lacked a quarterback. And I know Baker Mayfield has looked terrible this year, but I mean, the quarterback class this year stinks. Let's be honest. And look, you, you just have to do something. I mean, you can't just uh, give it to Fitzpatrick for another year, and you can't just give it to Heineke for another year. You have to look at the market and assess. And Mayfield is probably up there. What about you, Lorenzo? Yeah, so Paul and Ryan, you you took my uh, my first two picks, and I also got to give a shout out to Vinny Saba, who covers the Giants for us. A heavy, he's done a tremendous job of staying in touch of what's going on with that QB situation. I am going to point out this. I'm going to call it a dark horse pick, but I started thinking about it. I think it could definitely make sense for Baker Mayfield, and it's out in the AFC West. I'm thinking the Denver Broncos. And here's the reason why. We don't know what's going to really happen with Teddy Bridgewater. He is a free agent for the 2022 class. It seems like they're not sold on Drew Locke. Maybe John Elway, with his QB background, maybe he could talk some sense into Baker Mayfield. Maybe that change of scenery could help for Baker Mayfield. I mean, Denver Denver just, it seems like post Peyton Manning, they've been very unsettled overall at quarterback. Maybe Baker can give him that stability. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm going to say this, uh, I, 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 despite the fact that uh, Mr. Sanudo, uh said several, you know, crazy con- comments 
about the institution of marriage and the honeymoon. I have no idea what he's talking about. It's called the honeymoon phase. It's called the honeymoon phase, Brian, if you've heard of that. that, Is it? Is but I don't think that actually relates to marriage. I think that's something that is a marriage term that is wrapped around other instances. It's not Brian, how's your relationship going, by the way? Are things yeah, good? I mean, yeah, it's been pretty great. It's been yeah. freaking, That's good to freaking hear. great. Well, it can relate to Taylor Heineke because a lot of Washington fans thought he was the answer, and I don't think they think that anymore. So, yeah, well, yeah, I definitely think that's the case. I definitely think that's the case. Uh, I, I would agree that Washington is the place uh, for Baker Mayfield. I also think that we're beating Baker up a little too much. Um, mm-hmm. He has been just ravaged by injuries this year. Uh, and I I can't act as though that's not the case. Um, he still completed 62% of his passes. Uh, he'll probably eclipse 3,000 yards. Um, you know, if he plays next week, he'll probably go over that. I don't know what he had today. Uh, they lost, obviously, on Monday night. Um, but I don't know, you know, how well he played. Didn't play very well at all, only – you know, two touchdowns, two picks, 185 yards, only 16 completions on 38 passes, uh, and got sacked nine freaking times, which doesn't help. Um, but he's a year removed from a 26 touchdown, eight interception season, um, where he was healthy and played in all 16 games. So, has he had a bad year? I definitely believe he has. Uh, could Cleveland benefit from a change of scenery and, you know, changing up the, the, the leadership there at quarterback? I believe they could. But I don't think that he is a complete, like, reclamation project. Not after ah, – excuse me. Not you. after – not thank you. Not after one, one down season that's obviously impacted by injury. Uh, we're not talking about a, a an old quarterback. We're talking about a guy who's 26. He won't even be 27 until April. So I think we all have a tendency of just there's no middle. You know, I say that all the time. There's no middle. A guy is either the greatest thing since sliced bread or he sucks. He's trash. What happened to him? Kill him. You know, and I think there's often times where the truth is and the true and the most – Accurate assessment is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I do think that well, the Washington football team makes a lot of sense for him. Um, Terry McLaurin is a fantastic wide receiver who will not. And I think this is a big thing for Baker. Um, I think Odell Beckham Jr.'s personality was just entirely too big for Baker. And I think that it hurt his overall confidence and it hurt his leadership. And for Washington, he doesn't and won't have a personality on the offensive side of the ball like that. Ron Rivera is very much a player's coach who really has, in the past, made things very comfortable for his quarterbacks. Uh, And so I think that is the right type of situation and the right spot for him. And I wouldn't be surprised if he had a very good season if he were traded to the Washington football team. But I also wouldn't be surprised if he had a solid season with Cleveland, because I don't think he's done or just, you know, he needs to sit and get healthy. I think the best thing probably for him this year was to have sat out when he hurt his shoulder and just let, and just, and just been out, you know, he's not a guy who cries about injuries. So we don't even really know to what extent he is hindered. So I think that's a big deal. Uh, So that, that's my take with him, but yeah, I, I think I do agree with Ryan that the Washington football team would be a solid uh, a solid spot. And I did see that um, Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated linked Mayfield to Washington. I think he linked them also to New Orleans. So that's another mm-hmm. possibility. I, I honestly don't think he's going to get traded, but this is just – we're just throwing spitballs right now. And, you know, if they were to ever think about it um, – I think Washington, New Orleans, those are the two teams right there that make a lot of sense, especially New Orleans, if you think about it. I mean, I, I think Breer brought it up too, that Breer, not Breer, Breeze, six foot, Mayfield, six foot, Payton's dealt with, you know, that type of guy in the past. I know Mayfield is not Drew Breeze, but, you know, it doesn't make, it doesn't like sound, you know, outlandish, you know, him as a shot, you know, a possibility to New Orleans as well. The thing of it is, is that when Drew Brees left the San Diego Chargers, he didn't, he wasn't Drew Brees yet either. Yeah. 
-hmm. you know, so that's the thing that everyone has to remember, you know, until a guy turns the corner and has the year that they're going to have that changes the way we look at them. It is what it is. So, uh, it, you know, it'll be interesting to find out. Let's talk Cardinals uh, here. Keep one. James Conner, Chase Edmonds, or Christian Kirk. If you had to keep one of those guys, who are you keeping? I will start off, and I will say just off the top, for me, this is not even really much of a hesitation. It's Christian Kirk. It's who I'm keeping. I am going to tell you, uh, this is just my philosophy when it comes to football, especially on the professional level. If you ever ask me about keeping a running back versus a wide receiver and you're making me make a choice almost every single time, I'm going to say you keep the wide receiver. I can replace the running back. It's just automatic for me. It's just automatic. There are very few running backs who have ever played this game to me who I believe are special enough to put over an equally special or somewhere comparably special wide receiver and certainly quarterback. Um, I think the guys in front of the running backs are more important than the running back himself. And uh, that's not to say that there's not some special guys out there. Derrick Henry's a freak. Um, you know, Christian McCaffrey, if he's in one piece, is an absolute difference maker. Uh, Nick Chubb is a difference maker. Kareem Hunt's a difference maker. There's some good running backs in the NFL. Najee Harris is looking nice. Good running backs in the NFL. But so many times I've seen Timmy Smith's, Natron Means, and uh, Antoine Smith's and guys like that, um, you know, have huge games in the biggest situations, play big roles for teams who, you know, so-and-so running, running back went down, but the offensive line stayed healthy. But somehow you look back at the statistics the next week and the team still won. And the next running back ran for 105 yards. The next running back ran for 110 yards because the offensive line and the overall scheme is still there. So for me, Christian Kirk is a dynamic playmaker who they need. The Arizona offense needs alongside DeAndre Hopkins, hopefully healthy. Uh, Rondale Moore, hopefully healthy. And, uh, you know, with A.J. Green. So I'm taking them. And I love James Conner, and I think Chase Edmonds is a dynamic player. But I'm taking – I'm keeping Christian Kirk if I have to keep just one. Mm. What mm -hmm. say you, Paul, as you shaketh your headeth? Man, what a terrible take, uh, Brian. Oh, uh, it's the most beautiful not. take. It's actually the most beautiful take of the day. Oh, I don't think anyone will ever be able to beat it, but you can go ahead and try. But that's okay. It's okay. I'm used to those kind of terrible takes on this show from Brian. <laughs> but, uh, anywho, let's, here's the thing. You say, oh, man, it's it's uh, you know it's harder to replace some of these wide receivers or running backs. Uh, Antoine Wesley? Who even is that? I say that name, and Ryan Sununu covers the Cardinals. Probably doesn't even know who the hell that is. Like, uh, you, this Wesley guy is making plays. He's do making things happen. And you just mentioned a bunch of the receivers. You're going to get Hopkins back. You got Ron Rondale Moore. You got Wesley Snipes out there. You, you got future Hall of Famer A.J. Green. I mean, where does Christian Kirk fit? Where is the money under the cushion? to pay this man he's going to be richly paid in the offseason by somebody it just won't be the arizona cardinals the answer to this question boys is simple and i thought we were all going to be unanimous i thought we would all agree but obviously not everyone uh, can bring the same level of expertise to the show that i can and you know that's why they pay me the big bucks but with that being said it's james connor and he has struck gold it's james connor he was a great story right he overcame cancer was at pit gets to the Pittsburgh Steelers, he rises up, and then Pittsburgh Steelers throw him on the side of the road like a yesterday's garbage, and Arizona came up, dusted him off, and say, come over to the desert, James, and let's see what you can do. And he has been reborn. He's a touchdown machine. And, to, and some people may say, ah, oh, it's a one-year wonder. James Conner is having a crazy year, touchdowns. You can't predict those kind of things. And to those people, those people are wrong, just like, uh, you know, Brian already has been on this show. <laughs> They, they have found something here. He's a beautiful scheme fit. He's a he's in a great place. He's in a great offense. This is fantastic. James Conner has to be retained by any measure possible. I'm putting a blank check on the table. I'm sliding it over to James Conner because he provides that 
chutzpah to this team. He's the secret sauce that makes everything go. He can run the ball. He can catch a ball in the backfield. He can pass block. He could run block for himself if he wanted to. That's how dynamic and versatile of a player. Brian, Brian's falling asleep. Looks like he's uh, this is asleep. That's just the most <laughs> insane, ridiculous thing I've heard in my life. So and you should have been telling me that you got to keep a running back who is – he is a power back, so he's yeah. not a guy who is – you know, who's who's affecting this is based on his agility and speed, and now he's a power back. Yeah. But he's 26 already. We already know what age 27 means for most running backs in history. It means he's another had, great year. That's what that means. No, it means that downhill from here. And he's already had uh, some injury history. Um, this is – I'm not saying throw the guy, you know, in the garbage heap, but we're talking about – you mean to tell me you would rather have a 26 year old power back who yeah. it, it, then Christian Kirk this every is day insane. and twice on Sunday, baby. This and is let me insane. also say is uh, I forgot to mention the other uh, guy, guy in this group, Chase Edmonds. I mean, this guy is nothing He's more closer to it to me than James Connor. Oh, don't even <laughs> don't, don't start this Brian. I, I have is. a family for Pete's sake. Don't do this. He Chase is. Edmonds. Okay. Is nothing more than a rotational back. That's what he is. Okay. Oh, my God. He couldn't even be they He's cannot far break together. That. That's all Edmonds is. He is, he Edmonds is, is far the change more than that. Back. Okay. Nothing oh. more. He's more That's than that. You can swing him out wide. Oh. He's a injury problem out of the backfield. He's a yeah. matchup problem as a receiver. He is. He is a Darren Sproles light kind of a oh. player, and that is not a rotational back. He's a great cheerleader. He's probably the best cheerleader the Cardinals have on the team. When he's on the sideline and going. Arizona Cardinals, let's go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he does it better than anyone I've ever seen because he's doing that when James Conner is scoring touchdowns, okay? Let's pick the best running back on the team, and Chase Edmonds is not that. I'm sorry, man. Yesterday, news. see ya. Chase, uh, Chase don't Edmonds. let the door hit you. Chase Edmonds may not be one you. of the best running back. He may not be the best <laughs> running back on the team, but he is he's one of the best back football back. players on the team. See ya. James Conner, baby, all football. day, every day. <laughs> that is the, the level, the level. Of uh, THC that was in whatever it was you had today <laughs> was obviously extremely high. So we just, I'm just saying. What about okay. you, Lorenzo? Paul, you're going to hate me for this. I'm going with Christian Kirk. You keep Christian Kirk. All right, here's the thing. Christian Kirk, <laughs> Paul, yeah, you could you could doze off, fall asleep all you want. Christian <laughs> Kirk is actually nearing 1,000 yards receiving in a loaded receiving court. He's closing in on 1,000 yards, so they do know how to use him. And then he, as you fall down the side or go to the bathroom or whatever the case you do, <laughs> I mean, he's averaging 12.5 <laughs> yards per catch in an offense that's not even designed for the running game. It's designed for the pass. He's a perfect fit. I'll also add this about Christian Kirk. He, he's a ticket seller for that franchise, and here's the reason why. He's a Scottsdale, Arizona guy. NFL teams, they love the local guys. So I feel like Christian Kirk stays. You, the other two, Sayonara. Hmm. So, Mr. Sanudo, who has yes, spent help us out. the past 45 years covering the Arizona Cardinals. Or Cardinals 50 years, franchise. 50 years. <laughs> 50 uh, who say, who do you Come say? on, Ryan. Come on, Ryan. Okay. All right. This is the moment of truth right here. I'm well, going right, to have to agree out. with both Brian and Lorenzo. Christian Kirk. Oh. I mean, I thought all of us were going to say Christian Kirk, or maybe it'd be two Christian Kirk, two Edmonds. Um, but you want to say, uh, looking out, looking from the sidelines, I mean, Connor's missed the last two games with a heel injury, and I don't even think he's going to play against the Seahawks uh, next week. They always say, oh, hopeful, blah, 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 when it comes to injuries. But I think Kingsbury is going to say, you know what, it's the last week of the season. Let's not, you know, disrupt uh, Connor. And, you know, you looked at Connor. The, I think I jinxed him right before he got hurt. I think I put in an article, you know, he had the most games in his career with 14 in one season, and then boom, gets put on the sidelines. So I do I do agree with Paul with a couple takes that Connor, you know, moves mm. the chains. You know, he's, he actually steals touchdowns away from Edmonds, you know, inside the red zone. But, you know, I got to say, like, Christian Kirk, you're going to be taking away 100 targets if he is not going to be on the Cardinals next year. And, okay, you can replace that with Rondell Moore. Who, by the way, I've liked Rondell Moore, but there's certain times where Kingsbury hasn't 
put him downfield. It's still a work in progress with him. Um, and Kirk, I, I think he's going to be around the 10, 11, 12 range uh, per year. And, I, and I'm looking, there's a lot of guys that are going to be off the books. I think that's a guy you can easily uh, bring back. And you know what? I, I think they're easily going to keep at least one of Edmonds and um, uh, Connor. But let's say you don't. Let's say the Cardinals don't, which I think they will. You got Inu Benjamin, who looked, f- yep. looked really good. You know, another uh, sure. native of Arizona. So, look, I think the running back position is easily replaceable. Um, Edmonds is definitely a guy that I like more than Connor because he moves. He definitely is shifty. You know, he's a guy that can move around. He's in the slot at times. Um, he can, you know, get that extra yardage. And you saw that against the Cowboys. So, look, Edmonds, I, I think, is a guy that's younger as well. So I, I totally, you know, if I were starting to build the Cardinals franchise next year after the playoffs, um, Edmonds is my guy and Kirk is my guy. But if I had to keep one of them, it's definitely uh, Christian Kirk. Yeah, I mean, man, I, I don't I really don't even see how anybody's saying anything different. But then again, you know, terrible. Yeah. And listen, Christian Kirk he used to have the drop season his first couple years, and he's definitely, you know, cleaned that up. I think he has a 75% uh, catch rate, which is really good. Wait, let me just see this. Yeah, 75. So he's really, you know, putting together a, a really nice season. Um, and I think he's very overlooked in this offense too. And he leads the league and it leads the team in targets. So I don't know how you can just poo poo Christian Kirk out of this offense. I don't think you can. No, I, I really think you can't either. I think it's insane <laughs> to do. I mean, he, he has more drops this season than he's ever had, but he also has the most targets that he's ever oh, had yeah, yeah, that's in the season. So, and um, drops are so and he could stretch, so- he stretched us, he could stretch the field. For that offense, and I mean, again, there's like one too many, yeah, there's one too many targets, but they know how to, they find ways to use them and get involved. Yeah, I mean, he he he, dro- he probably drops too many passes. Six percent of his passes he drops this season, Ooh, which is the highest wow. of his career. But uh, there's been other other wide receivers with that similar issue, and even when you still compare, even with that, no one's saying he's. Debo Samuel has dropped, so they still, yeah, yeah, yeah nobody's saying seven. he's necessarily an elite wide receiver. I'm saying. If you had to pick one person to keep between him, James Conner, and Chase Edmonds, yeah. I think you keep Ch- Christian Kirk. Chase Edmonds is second, and James Conner, in my opinion, is a, is a distant third. J- James because, Conner will be a jet, Paul. It's all right. James Conner. I mean, will be it's, a jet. it's crazy. Come on down. That's a great fit. Up here it's looking like this guy getting freaking Corey Schlesinger touchdowns, and we're adding those <laughs> up that's like it. they're big deals. You know, for anybody that's too young, Corey Schlesinger touchdowns. He's the guy who used to take touchdowns away from Barry Sanders in Detroit. Yep. The, you know, Barry would get all the way down inside the yeah. five and they'd give the ball to Schlesinger and have him, you know, ram it in. Yeah, okay, no. We, I, how about we we leave Peyton Hillis over away from, you know, Arizona yeah. and we move on? Yeah, yeah, let's move on. Let, let's talk Patriots, guys. Let's talk Patriots. Mm-hmm. Do we have to? We, we <laughs> must because they're actually a playoff team. And wow. I know. I, and I know that's like a foreign kind of a concept for Jets people. I get it. Yeah. But it's something. So, but there is some conversation to be had. This is the second time this season the Patriots have gone for 50 points. They beat the Jaguars in week 17, 50 to 10. Earlier in the year, they <coughs> beat the Jets um, 54, to like, was it like three or something? No, it was, it was. It was, it was, it was it was a massive massacre of massive proportion. Is that enough massives for you guys? Like it, it was massive. It's a massacre, massive, it was a massive, uh, massacre oh, Paul of massive just, proportion. Paul just left the chat. <laughs> yeah, fifty-four to thirteen was the score. So I mean, the Jets actually did better than the Jaguars, which is something. Did Did Paul just leave? He just left. Yeah, he's, he he's, left he's off and building off. Yeah. as we talked about this particular thing. He's off and this on. This is crazy. This is how we're doing it? Wow. At any rate. So the thing of it is, is, and this conversation came up, um, you know, right after the second game with the Jets. The Patriots beat the Jets 54 to 13. And the question was, is there an issue with this, right? We're in the fourth quarter. Game is well in hand. Okay. And not only is 
not only does Bill Belichick still have the most vast majority of his starters on the field, they're freaking throwing the ball. And I'm talking about taking deep shots down the field. And clearly not, not, I mean, they're not, they're not caring. Like they're like a they're like that kid playing Madden who like doesn't care. He's up like 38 to 10 and he's scoring touchdowns, kicking, kicking on side kicks to get the roll right back. It just they're, they're, that, they're like that guy, right? Yeah. So they did it again yesterday. And so here's the crazy thing about it, too, right? They Belichick will then start to go to his bench, bring in Brian Hoyer, brings in some 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 backup receivers, and they're still chunking it. They're still throwing the ball. They're still taking deep shots. Happened against the Jets. It happened against the Jaguars last week. So the question is, do you fault Bill Belichick for – and some people don't want to say running up the score. They don't like the way that sounds. They don't like the way that feels. But, I mean, it really is what it is. They, they're they like, hey, you can't stop us. We're going to keep scoring. Do you have a problem with that? So I'm going to say – I'm going to give my take on it. Um, I personally don't have a problem with it. I call it what it is. It is running up the score. It is driving your foot across the face of your opponent and not caring how they feel about it. But you know what? This is big boy sports, and this is how it works. If – the, the best thing you can do if you don't like it when I score is keep me from scoring again. That's that's the best thing you can do. If you don't like it, you got to stop me. And that's just what it is. Sitting up saying, oh, it's classless. The game's is over already. Why would you continue to score touchdowns in that way? This is just classless. Could to who? You know, and then there's and, and I'm going to say something. And you guys are probably going to really be like, oh, my God, you're a horrible human being. So I've coached. Uh, Youth basketball oh, before I have coached I uh, grammar school, know, yeah. coached high school, you know, whatever basketball. And there are times, right, when I've had, you know, I've had some really good teams. I had a team where we went uh, undefeated and won the okay. whole section or whatever, right? Um, fan, it was a great time. I was coaching my son as well. And I'm telling you, some games we just, we're mowing kids down, like mowing kids over. So what I would do, is I would pull all my starters, which is how we got the lead, and then I would br- I would keep one of my starters on the floor. And then I put a bunch of kids on the floor who generally would never hardly get a chance to score, or do it, but this was their time to get their thing. And I'd keep one starter on the floor to kind of help facilitating them getting their offense because I wanted those kids to have a, a good day, right? <clears throat> now on a professional level, no, and 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 trust me, I got some flack for that, right? Because they were trying. Why you still have him on the floor? Because I'd either keep my son on the floor or his friend. They were the guards. They could handle the ball the best. They could get kid shots. So on a professional level, that's not the case. But what you do have is you do have a secondary motive that is not really about rubbing it in the face of the opponent. Sometimes it's simply about, hey, we got other stuff to work on and we want to prepare our second string guys for being able to, you know, to be ready in the event that they're mm-hmm. called on. We're talking about the NFL. Brian Hoyer is the starting quarterback after one bad play. You know, somebody gets breaks through, hits Mac Jones, he falls wrong. Suddenly Brian Hoyer is the starting quarterback. Now, obviously, he's a veteran. He's played. But this is the mentality that you have to have. So for that reason as well as the I'm just not a subscriber to the whole participation trophy kind of a concept, I have no problem with scoring until the clock <laughs> runs out. What do you say, Lorenzo? This is the time of year where you're going to see killer instincts, people in assassin modes, and guess what? This is Bill Belichick doing just that. No, I do not fault Bill Belichick one bit. If anything, He's clearly sending the message. We're back in the playoffs. We're not here for a participation trophy. Don't bleep with us. We're trying. We're here to make a run, and we're making our statement, even if it's against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I, I mean, I, I've seen this also across the landscape, not just at youth, youth, at youth sports as well. I mean, I could have started. Maybe, maybe I might have covered your basketball game, Brian, because I remember. <laughs> But, like, I mean, in college football, like, you go against, like, a lesser program, it's like they're going to put 70 on. 
and they're going to most likely pull their starters in the third quarter and then let the other guys, the other four or five stars or whatever, play just to build their confidence. I'm looking at it like maybe he was secretly trying to build Brian Orr's confidence, especially in the event that Mac Jones may, may be in the situation where he's struggling and they need that assurance. But this, this is the time of year where it's like, you know, you, you get into this killer mode. You get into this, like, you know, real, like, aggressive volley mode. You're not going to win in the playoffs being passive. So I have no problem with this at all. And I'm not even a Patriots fan. I hear it. I hear it. What do you say, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, you got to respect the process. I mean, this is the NFL. This is not Pee Wee. This is not flag football here. Um, we're in a professional sports league here. And I'll be completely honest, there were so many games going on. I did not watch a single second of the Jaguars Patriots game because I knew we all Dude, knew like, what it was going to be. Unless you're covering the team, you know, either team, you're not watching that game. Okay, Brian, you watched it. Um, but no, I, I was covering it. That's not yeah, you're yeah, covering it. Covered. I completely understand. But like, you were whoever was watching and you were like a bystander to it, you're watching a train wreck, but you're going to watch the train wreck because it's entertaining, you know, whatever. Like, but I, I just don't see what the issue is here. Like, I don't even know like what to say. Like, the Jaguars almost deserve to get beaten on the way they've been running the organization the last, I don't know, like 10, 15 years with the con, you know, putting Meyer into that situation, um, making Lawrence look like, you know, a sixth round pick. I mean, this is a wake up call. I think uh, the Jaguars definitely need to, you know, experience this and uh, the Patriots look, they're a couple weeks away from going to the playoffs. Why are they just going to put the foot on, you know, the gas and just, uh, foot on the break uh, and just say, you know what, let's just uh, put out, you know, our four string guys and three string guys. Let, let's let's take it up a notch. And, you know, we got the Dolphins next week and we, we got to see how how things go there. So I, I completely agree with you guys. I don't, I don't even know what the question is here. Like this, this is definitely like a respect the game, respect the process, respect the, how this uh, football league goes. I mean, this is NFL for crying out loud. Yeah, you know, I think one other factor that does bear you need to be mentioned, and I, it doesn't change the way I feel, but it does need to be mentioned. The Jaguars roster was also ravaged by COVID nineteen, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, absences. So we're already talking about a two win team. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a two win team that's also ripped apart by COVID. And every team in the NFL has some level of some sort of COVID issue mm-hmm. going on, but the Jaguars were hit particularly hard. Uh, so that does bear does deserve to be mentioned. I still don't I still don't fault Bill for doing it, but that does add a little bit more perspective to why maybe some people may have felt like, okay, Bill, they're dead. Stop kicking yeah. them, you know, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. But what say you, Paul Green? Paul, yeah, let me tell you something. Paul Boy Green Esden is one of the biggest Bill Belichick fans I've ever met in my life. <laughs> he has like pictures of Bill. Yeah, so uh, he's doing like a Christmas <laughs> ornament on his Christmas tree that is actually like a little hoodie. So I know how much, I know how you love it. So tell me what you say. Uh, a couple of things here. You know, I am a big Madden fan uh, and shout out, obviously a uh, rest in peace uh, to John Madden, one of the great yes. uh, football icons yes, we've yes, ever yes. seen, but I am a Madden video game fan. And uh, the two analysts uh, that you hear talking during the game are Brandon Godden, good friend and Charles Davis. And what Charles Davis will say, because they pre-program all these lines for all kinds of situations in the game, when I'm railing somebody, I'm scoring a bunch of points, Brandon Guy will be like, what the hell is he doing out there? Lay off the horses. You're you're beating them pretty bad. Charles Davis will be like, we always got to worry about the scoring tiebreaker. You know, that's a, that's what you got to tell the other team. You're trying to score as many points just in case. Yeah, you got to go to the scoring tiebreaker. So obviously that's always a, a factor here. And also, uh, you know, can we fault Trevor Lawrence for continuing to give Patriots opportunities with all these picks? I mean, geez, a loo, Trevor Lawrence. And it's not enough of a story. Maybe it's because Jacksonville and they suck. But he has like one touchdown pass like the last nine games. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, Peyton Manning, all these kinds of prospects not looking too uh, tasty. But let's get to the question. Do I fault Bill Belichick for running up the score on this wounded animal that is known as the Jacksonville Jaguars? Absolutely not. No, this team stinks. They suck. Bill Belichick has a weird fascination and probably should be evaluated by a mental institution for his weird sick pleasure in in beating teams. Not that I know anything about that in particular, but he does seem to have this 
this history. I wouldn't be surprised if a shaman on that show snapped, you know, where, where things just happen and he just, like, randomly attacks somebody. It seems like he has a lot of pent-up emotion mm -hmm. happening inside that hoodie there for old Mr. Bill Belichick. So, no, you can't fault him. This is the NFL. This is a league where people are getting paid on both sides. You got to sack up, okay? If you don't want to get scored on, then play some gosh darn defense out there. I hate when teams and players all over the place are whining, crying, like, oh, you ran up the score. I'm not cool with that. If you're not cool with it, then stop it, bro. That's what you get paid to do. So, no, I can't fault Bill Belichick. Obviously, I'm his number one fan. There's no one that is a bigger fan of Bill Belichick than me, obviously. So, you know what? If they want to celebrate – and, uh, you know, part you know, get all excited about, you know, being a wild card team and not winning the division for the second straight year. I'm all about it for the New England Patriots. Way to go. Way to not win the division. You know what? I would be celebrating, too, if if uh, I was making a wild card appearance. Uh, you know, that's great. That's great for New England. Way to go. Solid. You, you, former I'm former sure, Jets sure, coach Bill Belichick. I'm sure former you would Bill. actually be right. celebrating if you were getting, <laughs> making yeah, a wild card. It hasn't happened in 11 years for guys. Yeah, like, <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah. like, that's yeah. pretty. Yeah. yeah. Former Jets coach Bill Belichick also. That's right. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. For a day. Or yeah. Hour. For for like 24 hours. Uh, I forget how long it was. Napkin. Very nice. He wrote it on the napkin. I don't want to be here. This place is horrible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It happened. Yeah. All right. Last question, gentlemen. All right. We're talking Niners. Who gives the Niners a better chance to win in week 18? And this one is – this is important. This, yeah. is, this is freaking important. Like, this game is freaking important, peeps. Like, it's important. Is it Trey Lance? Does she give – I mean, he started in week 17 mm -hmm. and was able to help guide them to a victory? Or is it Jimmy Garoppolo, you know – who looks like the 2021 Marlboro man without his hat. And wow, that's Kyle, old school. Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan has to make a decision about where he's going to go with this whole thing. So for me, honestly, here's the reason why I'm going to tell you, I am going with Trey Lance. Ooh. And I'm going to tell you why I would go with Trey Lance. This up on his paper last week. Beep, beep, beep. This no, no, it, it's it's this really thing. not. It's little really back not, pedal, it's, little back pedal action. No, it's it's really not. Let him answer. Let him answer. Let him answer. It's, it's really not that. It's little really hamstrings. That. I, I mean, I still feel the same pedal. way that I feel about Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo is not a hundred percent, and I doubt strongly that he will be a hundred percent in Week 18. And even if he was a hundred percent, where they are right now. At the very end of a season, that even if they beat the Rams, somehow beat the Rams, the super, the 49ers are not a Super Bowl contender. They are a team that hopefully gets into the postseason if they can right. win. Right. And they, but they're not a Super Bowl contending team. So my thought process would be the future begins right now. Trey Lance won in week 17. We're going to put him on the biggest stage possible in the regular season. A week 18 must win game against the division leading Los Angeles Rams. And if this kid can win us into the postseason, maybe he gets hot in the postseason and some different things happen. But we go in either way if he gets us this victory. We go into next year with insane momentum with a quarterback who has more than likely won over his teammates, even more so than he might have from the beginning anyway, uh, because of his late season success and maybe whatever they can do in the postseason. If Jimmy Garoppolo were healthy, then I would probably say, you know, if he if Jimmy Garoppolo was healthy and he won them the game in week 17, then I would say Jimmy Garoppolo is the guy. But because I don't believe he'll be 100%, Trey Lance played well in Week 17. I'm going ahead right now, and I am moving forward with the Trey Lance mm. era starting right now. Mm. That's the decision I make. What mm. say you, Paul? Brian, thank you. I was getting a little lonely on the Trey Lance strange. I'm glad you're you're coming on. This is my dog. <laughs> this is my dog. I just, you know, I just wasn't on the – 
fast Jimmy train that you guys are on. Still uh, Jimmy G true there. You know? sure. I, I'm still, I still, I still think Jimmy G is a solid starting NFL quarterback. Mm. Let me say this. Is no. that, again, mm-hmm. last yeah. week I got trashed for my prediction on Trey Lance, my conversation on Trey Lance. But, folks, I, I feel like I've said this before, but maybe it's short-term memory loss on the show. I don't give predictions. I give spoiler alerts, people. So get ready for this take. And I am ready. I am ready to push this baby and drive and hit the pedal to the metal. Because here's the thing. I remember, and my memory's a little funky, I remember a couple years ago the 49ers had a little injury at the quarterback position. They they switched over from Alex Smith to some guy named Colin Kaepernick. And, oh, yeah, they went to the Super Bowl, man. So let me say this. With Jimmy Garoppolo, the 49ers are a one-and-done team in the playoffs. With Trey Lance, the ceiling is Super Bowl. That's what this guy does. The ceiling rises. His ability to both run the football, throw the football, he's a dynamic player. Jimmy Garoppolo is not dynamic. He is basic. He is blah. Okay, maybe I'll win some modeling contest. Good for you, man. But I'm talking about the football. That's the football bit. I'm talking about delivering on the football field. And I told you guys last week that Trey Lance is this dynamic player, and he's the guy I'm plugging in, injury or not. And you know what? Injuries we can't control. Alex Smith was playing pretty well for the 49ers prior to that injury. He got what? injured. They went to Kyle Kaepernick. Things were looking pretty good. And Harbaugh said, you know what? Let's just stick with the kid. It worked. It went to the Super Bowl. I think Shanahan makes the same decision. They traded up a bunch of picks to get this guy. He looked great last week he's probably going to play again this week as the entry he's gonna be like you know what things are spicy let's roll that train maybe toot toot and toot toot may take them to the super bowl so i don't think all these people saying 49ers may not be super bowl contenders you look at that defense you look at some guy named debo samuel look at the pieces on this team man i'm telling you trey lance ride the train ceiling is super bowl with trey lance i would not only pick trey lance for week 18 I picked Trey Lance for the next 15 years for the 49ers. Boom! How about that? Boom! 15 years, huh? Not bad. Not bad. Lock yeah. it in. That's not bad. Not what bad. about you, Ryan? Yeah, you're out of your mind if you're still on the Jimmy Garoppolo train. You're out of your mind. I mean, Kyle Shanahan completely changes his playbook when it comes to Trey Lance. I mean, mm-hmm. he wants to go downfield with Trey Lance. You see the explosiveness with the weapons with Debo and Kittle. I mean, all you see with Garoppolo are you know place you know throws down over the middle of the field where there's tons of traffic. And that's where it can lead to turnovers, and you saw that against the Titans. I mean, I don't know what, you know, 49ers fans were thinking. You know, I was looking at the comments, you know, you know, over the hill, over uh, Garoppolo. I mean, wh- what are we doing here? Like, this is 2022 right now. You drafted a quarterback with a third overall pick. You have Trey Lance. And look, he was a little bit shaky in the beginning. I mean, that's what's going to happen. You haven't played in a while. But then you come in and you beat the Houston Texans, and I know they're not that great, but they also beat the Chargers the week before, so you can't say really anything about that. So Trey Lance, I mean, the passing charts don't even lie when it comes Mm -hmm. to these two quarterbacks. They're completely different. Jimmy Garoppolo is a whole lot of blah. Um, I don't know how there are still Jimmy Garoppolo truthers out there. I mean, you're just basically defending a brutally, brutally fragile average quarterback at best that's what that's just the numbers the numbers don't lie you know the eye test doesn't lie and look we're in a passing league i mean you got to start utilizing these uh george kittles and these debo samuels man and you know what you saw it with trey lance you're not going to be seeing with jimmy garoppolo with a fractured finger for crying out loud like come on what what, Mm -hmm. we're, we're we're just being like we're being like clowns in a way, just even asking this question because it, it really makes no sense. A fractured finger and you're just going to put him out there against the Rams? Are, are we are we joking here? Like, let's put in Trey Lance and whatever happens with – I don't care if he throws four picks next week, Trey Lance. It, I still think it's the right pick. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't mm-hmm. – it, it, it being the right pick really doesn't have anything to do with how well he plays. Uh, and the biggest reason is because of the injury. <laughs> It's, I mean, Jimmy's injured, and Jimmy's, and even if he was able to get on the field, I don't think he'd be a hundred percent. And and because of that, you don't even you don't even think about this. You don't even yeah. Think. So 
What do you say, Lorenzo? So, so on that note, so Kyle Shanahan is is trying to explain, and he's insisting that he's going to put it Jimmy Garoppolo anyway, bad, bad thumb and all. But I've seen this before. When you have an entry and you're a San Francisco 49er, Kyle Shanahan is not going to put you out there. He didn't put Fred Warner out there. He didn't put Debo Samuel out there. What makes us think that he's going to put Jimmy Garoppolo out there? You go with the guy who gave you an element you haven't seen in quite some time, three seasons to be exact. That's Trey Lance. And here's another thing to think about. So, yeah, the 49ers are run first, pass later. Well, with Trey Lance, think about it. You could set up dangerously the play action with Trey Lance going against a secondary that, yeah, they have Jalen Ramsey, but Taylor Rapp is very suspect in pass coverage. Jordan Fuller has his moments. That, that's pro, that's also rough. why, you know, Jalen Ramsey smoked. Yeah, and Jalen Ramsey, like, went WWE on him as well. So, yeah, but it's like Trey – like Trey Lance to be like he he did enough to win me over and really solidified that Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. I think that's my that's my prediction for next season. I think Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. The thumb injury, the the fracture, it's like it's pretty much like the the final indie. Like you could close the book on the Jimmy Garoppolo chapter at this point. This is the Trey Lance era, or as he forty says, Trey area. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we will see. I, I I think we all believe that Trey Lance is the right guy, maybe for a few kind of slightly different reasons. Our first unanimous we, choice of the night. I think I think it is the first unanimous choice of the night. I, it, mostly because Paul likes to just say um, wrong stuff, and some sometimes people are wrong, and you just have to allow them to live in their wrongness, and that's what we've done with Paul. So uh, at any rate. I appreciate every last person who watched us today. Uh, and hopefully uh, you enjoy what you're seeing. Make sure you like the video. Subscribe to the channel as well. Peace. Peace.